Hi, this is Shadi Reyes, Denver, Colorado, CVI 2019. With me is Dr. William O'Neill. He is Director of Structural Heart Disease at Henry Ford, and he is the leader, a national leader, in cardiogenic shock. Welcome, Dr. O'Neill. Thank you so much, Shadi. Nice to see you. Same here. So you have been doing a lot of work for the last several years about shock, starting from DCSI to NCSI now, national. Tell us about a little bit of history and what do you see it envisioned going forward? Well, I've been doing shock uh, therapy for 40 years, and we started doing angioplasty for acute amide shock in the uh, early 80s, and we saw that there was a big improvement in survival with that therapy. Uh, but since the late 80s, there really hasn't been very much change. For the last 30 years, we've been treating shock patients exactly the same way. We, they come in in shock, you do angioplasty with or without a balloon pump, and the survival is about 50%. So, uh, honestly, nothing had changed. Uh, I tried to do a shock trial in 2000 with a cardiac assist, uh, it, but it was just too difficult with doing emergency transeptal punctures. There weren't enough people that could really do it with a decent sized volume, and the results were okay, uh, but nothing really came until Impella came. And then we started using the Impella, and in April of 2016, the device was approved for cardiogenic shock. That allowed us now a lot of flexibility in terms of designing trials. And we decided first we had to use, figure out how to use it. So when do you put it in, how do you put it in, and what are the therapies? And so we, we looked at the data from Abumed, from their IQ data, thousands of patients being treated, and we saw that the predictors of improved outcome was use of the right heart catheterization, using the Impella CP before angioplasty, and trying to put it in rapidly. Right. So those ba best practices, and as you know, in Detroit, we got together our friends, five hospitals, all got together, and we treated 50 patients, and we had an excellent survival. Yeah. And so that's kind of what led the impetus for all this. And then we went on a national basis, and now we have close to 100 centers that are working around the country to do this protocol. Impressive. Uh, one of the things kind of uh, I noticed that the right heart cath kind of re-emerged yeah. with the shock protocol. Yeah. How, how, how did it happen? And um, just tell the audience because they feel the critical care doctors, it does not change outcome. Yeah, well, so, the, in, uh, in the cardiology, it, it, it feels it, different. It, it's very strong in shock. The signal we've seen in multiple locations in the uh, in the U.S. national data, the field force data that Impella has gotten, uh, there's a 14% increase in survival for people that are treated with right heart support versus not. Wow. And so, if there's one simple thing that you can do, and to me, it's like kind of like driving a boat without knowing where you're going. Right. Uh, you, I don't. You can't intelligently manage the therapies of uh, of the uh, support devices. Do you need more inotropes or less? Are the patients being adequately supported? You really can't tell, and the blood pressure simply is not enough to be able to know whether or not you're having ac adequate forward flow. Right. That's where use of the right heart cath and measurement of cardiac output, and then the, the CPO has kind of become so important. And that's defined. The CPO measurement is our gold standard. Like, you know, when you work in the cath lab, if you do a, 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 a stable coronary lesion, you can't treat that without FFR. Exactly. Right? Five years ago, nobody knew what FFR was. Now you can't work without it. So that's kind of what we're trying to do with, with the shock, is we want to try to say, okay, right heart cath, CPO, that's the language that we want to start talking about because that tells us exactly how good the therapy is in getting blood to the extremities. You put together a very robust weaning protocol yeah. that's driven mainly by lactate and yeah. CPO. Right. So um, uh, beyond the cath lab, what is what what is your message to the critical care? Well, the, the, the battle is not done when the patient leaves the cath lab. I think that careful watch of the extremities to make sure that patients don't develop lower extremity ischemia is very important. And then the trends, and what we found is that if the CPO kind of goes up and the lactates come down, that's a fantastic trend. And so following those patients closely for 12 to 24 hours will really kind of tell you the trajectory of whether they're going to do very well or whether something more is going to need to be required. DTU presented at AHA in yeah. 2018. So, and there is a note, there is a bigger trial getting in design yes. and you are heavily involved. Yeah, uh, Naveen Kapoor and I are the co-PIs for 
DTU, and now we're, we are doing a pivotal trial. So what that is is door to unload, and uh, Naveen has had some fantastic basic science work suggesting that the milieu of reperfusion is very important in decreasing infarct size. And so what he's found is that if, if uh, in animal model, that if they put the impella in before they open the artery, uh, that they had an improvement in infarct size. Now we've done this, and so got some very intriguing pilot data on a 50 patient uh, trial that we did, and it looks as though, um, it looks as though we may improve uh, uh, infarct size, decrease infarct size by waiting for half an hour. So that, so now based on that, there's a, it's about a 500 patient trial. It's going to be big in a national and international study to take a look. So in patients with a large anterior MI, uh, we're going to go to the cath lab, we're going to put the impella in, and then wait for half an hour versus just go to the cath lab and usual care. So this is going to be a really good control trial to see whether or not we can show a reduction in infarct size. Uh, anterior MI is still a very important uh, problem because uh, we can get the patient out of the hospital. They're, they're alive, but they end up with a huge, yeah. a huge infarct. And so five, ten years down the road, is going to be an adverse consequence with uh, a lot of heart failure. Absolutely. You touched on it briefly, but vascular access is Achilles heel yeah. for the shock patients. Yeah. Yeah. How we can overcome that? Well, I, I don't know if you can overcome it, but I think you can deal with it. You know, so I think that uh, you have to have some strategies for fi figuring out how to do anti-grade uh, perfusion. You and uh, Amir Kaki and Ted Shriver has taught, taught us a lot because uh, doing integrate punctures and, and, or coming around from the other side, uh, uh, they're all kind of good strategies, but I think the most important thing is that you really have to recognize that the problem exists. So it's very simple. After you're done with the shock, you got the peel away sheath, uh, there's an obturator that you can take, uh, take out, and then you can just do a, a quick dye injection to see if there's flow around the shaft. If there's flow, then you're okay. If there's not, then you have to fix it before they leave the lab. Right. If, if, you don't, if, they, if, if the patient leaves the lab with leg ischemia, that's almost like 100% mortality. Right, right. Yeah. Do you see the shock, the shock code and shock team treated like STEMI, where if there's a shock happening within certain radius should be transferred to a shock program? Yeah, I think that uh, right now the reality is that 60% of patients in acute MI shock coming into small community hospitals. And so we've got to figure out a way of doing a hub and spoke. Yes. And I think that uh, honestly the best and what we're doing at, at, at Henry Ford Health System is that the operators at the other hospitals are doing the putting an impella, doing the PCI, and then transferring the patients. Mm. And I think that's really probably the best strategy for right. people presenting to smaller hospitals. I mean, in, in, a, in, a, in a dream world, you would love to have ambulances that drive only to shock centers. And you know, they go home, patients in shock, they bring them directly to a shock hospital rather than to the closest one. And right. that, that's going to take a little bit of, of doing on a national basis before that gets established. So your protocol reduced the mortality from 50% yeah, to, to 20 to 25%. Percent. Exactly. Yeah. So that's from do you see this you're you're going to continue to push that envelope more? Yeah, we'd like to we're going the next phase is a more aggressive strategy where we're going to look to see whether or not uh, people that don't have adequate cardiac power output with Impella, whether we can boost it to escalate. So uh, we're looking at that as a strategy to try to get, we'd like to get the patients out of the cath lab out of shock, leaving the cath lab out of shock. Right. I think that's kind of the goal. And if we can do that, I think we're going to improve survival. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Neill, for your time. My pleasure. Very insightful uh, information about uh, the cardiogenic shock initiative. Please uh, watch this video and others on CVI YouTube channel. This is Shadi Reyes from Denver, Colorado. Thank you. Thank you. Very good.